choir will come and have some special music. Amen. Go ahead and find your seat. Amen. We got a little bit more special music this morning. Brother Matthew's going to come. He's going to sing a song for us. And then Julie, Ronnie, and Renee also have a special. So. Good morning. So around Christmas, I played Hallelujah, and it was the Christmas version. So I'm going to be playing Hallelujah again, but it's the Easter version. I hope you all enjoy it. I 
A crown of thorns placed on his head He knew that he would soon be dead He said, did you forgive me, Father, did you? They nailed him to a wooden cross Soon all the world would feel the loss Of Christ the King before his high who had used his sword to pierce the body of our Lord said truly this is Jesus Christ our Savior he looked with fear upon his sword then turned to face his Christ the Lord fell to his knees now crying hallelujah hallelujah From his head the thorny crown And wrapped him in a linen gown And laid him down to rest inside the tomb The holes in his hands, his feet inside Now in our hearts we knew he died To save us from ourselves now stone to bless the slain with oil and spice anointing hallelujah but as they went to move the stone they saw that they were not alone but Jesus Christ has risen hallelujah hallelujah Yesterday he was in her arms, where did the time go? 
She can hear the driving nails upon the hillside. And she prays that his spirit will not fail. She watches as a young man undertakes his father's will. And she stands and listens to the driving She can hear the driving nails upon the hillside, and she prays that his spirit will not fail. She watches as a young man undertakes his father's will, and she stands and listens to the driving Amen. Thank you very much. Appreciate all the special music this morning. Can y'all hear me okay? I might need a little more volume on this lapel. All right. Turn your Bibles, if you would, to the Gospel of Luke in chapter number 19. Luke's Gospel in chapter number 19. Again, I welcome you here today on this Palm Sunday. We are thankful for each and every one of you. Thankful for our visitors. And I pray today you've come with a open heart and an open mind to hear and be receptive of God's Word. The Lord is so good to us. He's done so much for us. And dying on the cross of Calvary, we should never forget that. And we shouldn't just set it aside as one Sunday or a week or a month of the year. We should be forever thankful for that. And we've been preaching about those things for the last several weeks. And we've been looking at that little sermon series, I Shall Not. But today, I do want to preach to you a Palm Sunday message, I believe. But from a little bit different perspective, I want to look at it today. We always look at Jesus riding into Jerusalem, and we look at the significance of that and the things that surround it. But I want us to look from through his eyes this morning, if we could. Luke's Gospel, chapter number 19, I want to begin reading, if I could, this morning, in verse number 28, and we'll read down through verse 48. Luke 19, verse number 28. And when he had thus spoken, he went before, ascending up to Jerusalem. And it came to pass when he was come nigh to Bethpage in Bethany at the mount called the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples, saying, Go ye into the village over against you, in the which you are entering, you shall find a colt tied, and whereon yet never man set. Loose him, and bring him hither. And if any man ask you what you do, you loose him. Thus say, ye, say unto him, Because the Lord hath need of him. And they that were sent went their way. And found even as he had said unto them. And as they were loosing the colt, the owners thereof said unto them, Why loose ye the colt? And they said, The Lord hath need of him. And they brought him to Jesus, and they cast their garments upon the colt, 
and they set Jesus thereon. And as he went, they spread their clothes in the way. And when he was come nigh, even now at the descent of the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of the disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice for all the mighty works that they had seen, saying, Blessed be the King that cometh in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. And some of the Pharisees from among the multitude said unto him, Master, rebuke thy disciples. And he answered and said unto them, I tell you that if these should hold their peace, the stones would immediately cry out. And when he was come near, he beheld the city and wept over it, saying, If thou hadst known, even thou at this thy day, the things which belong unto thy peace, but now they are hid from thine eyes. For the day shall come upon thee, that thine enemies shall cast a trench about thee, and compass thee around, and keep thee in on every side, and shall lay thee even with the ground, and thy children within thee. And they shall not leave in thee one stone upon another, because thou knowest not the time of thy visitation. And he went into the temple, and began to cast out them that sold therein, and them that bought, saying unto them, It is written, My house is the house of prayer but you have made it a den of thieves. And he taught daily in the temple, but the chief priests and the scribes and the chief of the people sought to destroy him and could not find that they might do, for all the people were very attentive to hear him. Let's pray together today. Our Father, we do thank you, Lord, for this day. We thank you, Lord, for this gathering. We thank you, Lord, for uh, your people that have a desire to come to worship you and to praise you and to hear your word. And Lord, I'm thankful for each and every one of them. Lord, there's some that are not here today, the sick and the shut-in, and those, Lord, that are in the nursing homes. I pray, Lord, that you'd send a blessing to them. I know that they would love to be here. And Lord, we have some that are still gathered outside listening in the parking lot by the way of radio. We have some tuned in by live streaming on YouTube. And I pray, Lord, you'd bless them just the same way they'd be sitting inside of our building today. But Father, as we continue through the rest of this service, We thank you, Lord, for what you've already done, the time of praise through song and worship and the time of giving. And I pray, Lord, that we could clear our minds and our thoughts of those things that bring us down in our daily lives and help us, Lord, to, to focus on you. And, Lord, I do pray that you take the attention away from me. I pray that the attention's on you. It's on your word and on your son, the Lord Jesus Christ. I pray today for Christians that have gathered here that you would strengthen our hearts, that you would encourage us, that you would challenge us to be a better witness and a better testimony for you. Lord, not during this just this time of year when we celebrate your your death and your burial and your resurrection, but Lord, every single day of our life, help us be a witness for you. And Lord, I do pray there may be someone gathered here today, man, woman, boy, or girl, that does not know Christ as their Savior. I pray, Lord, today that your words, not my words, but your words, Lord, would speak to their heart, that they might realize if they're lost, the only way that they can be saved It's through the gift of salvation that come from your Lord, your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Lord, I pray you would open their hearts and they would be receptive to your word today. We thank you, Lord. We praise you. We ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Here we find this familiar story in the Gospel of Luke, and it's in the Gospel accounts in different ways. But today we're looking at the Gospel of Luke, and and there's some significance to this story. There's reasons why that Jesus come into Jerusalem. And there's two reasons I want to cover before we get into the message this morning. But number one, the Lord came and He came this way for a specific purpose and that was to fulfill prophecy. The entire Word of God is a, is a book really of prophecy and He came and He has fulfilled every single thing that He has promised with the exception of His return in the rapture of the church. And we're, as God's people, we should be longing and we should be waiting for that day. But here he came to fulfill prophecy, and Zechariah the prophet in chapter number 9, in verse number 9, explained it in great detail. He says these words in Zechariah 9, 9, he said, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O Jerusalem, behold, thy king cometh unto thee. He is just, and having salvation, lowly, and riding upon an ass, and upon a colt, the foal of an ass. And here it is very specific detail that Luke gives us that he comes in just that manner. Some of you may be here today and you may be a horse person. I know that Brother Floyd is. I know there's others here that have a a background in agriculture or a horse background. You know that this wasn't just any colt. This was a a donkey's colt and never a man had been set upon this colt. Now, 
challenge you this morning, if you're here, you're a horseman, you might be a good one, but go out in the field and get you a colt that's never been ridden and jump up on the back of that thing and head into town. I want to get my camera out and video you and watch you, but it was for a specific purpose. No man could be on this colt because it was for our Lord and Savior. They found this colt. He was there waiting for our Lord. They set him upon this colt, and he come riding into Jerusalem. And they shouted, as just as Zechariah said, O daughter of Zion, they said, Behold, thy king cometh. They shouted, Hosanna in the highest. They laid their coats and their clothes down in the way before him, and they laid palm branches down. Now the significance here is that any king of authority would roll in his royal uh, decree. He would have a, a, be on a, a big white horse or a big horse, or he would today caravan coming with flags and pomp and circumstance and rolling in, but not our king. He would come just as Zechariah prophesied. He would come riding into Jerusalem on the back of this donkey, and it's significant. The second thing is this. He would come to force the Jewish leaders to act. Now they knew that there was great crowds gathered for Passover and that they wanted to wait until after Passover to handle this problem that this man Jesus Christ was to them and to their message. But it was to fulfill prophecy that our Savior, the Lamb of God, would die on Passover. He would be the perfect sacrifice for your sins, and He had to die at this specific time. So we see this triumphal entry as we see it. It is for a specific purpose. Now, I wanted you to get your mind on the scene that is taking place. Jesus is on the back of this colt. He's riding into Jerusalem. The crowd is, is cheering. They're crying that their, their king has come and Hosanna in the highest and they're rejoicing. But for just a few moments as we get into this message, I want to shift gears and I want you to think about this thought. While the crowd rejoiced, Jesus wept. I want you to look at this scene through the eyes of Jesus and I believe that the, Luke gives us some pretty good details. The text verse is verse number 41 when it says, And when he was come near... He beheld the city, and notice what it says, he wept over it. This shows our Lord and Savior and as a part of man being uh, God in the flesh, that he wept. This is the second time that he would weep. We know that as he stood in, at the tomb of Lazarus, and I preached about that a few Sunday nights ago, he, he wept when his friend Lazarus died in John eleven thirty five. 35. All the young people who are trying to memorize Scripture this morning, I, I would encourage you to start there. It's the shortest verse in the Bible, John eleven thirty five. 35. Jesus wept, it's two words. You ought to be able to remember that. But here we see it in a different sense. As he comes into Jerusalem, he's riding on the back of this colt, and he sees what he beheld, beholds, it makes him weep. I want to look at a few things today that I believe that we can use in comparison to our life and maybe really should make us weep as well. The first thing is this, while the crowd rejoiced, Jesus wept because he looked back and he saw missed opportunity, wasted opportunity. Look at what verse number 42 says, saying, if thou hadst known, even thou at the least in this that thy day, the things which belong unto thy peace, but now they are hid from thy eyes. I believe as he rolled in and he had went through the crowds and he had approached Jerusalem, he had went through the, the descent as he came to the Mount of Olives and it said when he beheld the city, he began to weep because I believe he looked out and he saw wasted opportunity. Can I tell you this morning as a, as a pastor, uh, I want our church to grow. I want us to grow closer to God. Each and every day we get closer to the Lord's return. We need to be closer to God than we were yesterday. What a testimony it was this past week, as I've already shared, to see God's people, not just here at Ford for Christ, but all across our county. We didn't ask if they were Baptists, if they were Brethren, if they were Mennonite, Pentecostal, whatever you name it. We didn't ask those questions. They asked us to come together to help our community to provide for those men and those women that were out serving and trying to protect our community. I want to see our church grow. And I believe as a pastor, I can look out sometimes and I can look and I can see wasted opportunity. As a parent, you may look at a child or a grandparent or a, a, a niece or a nephew or whatever it may be to you, and you may look and see wasted opportunity. I believe as Jesus came into town, as he rode on the back of this donkey, he looked and he seen wasted opportunity. He's seen wasted opportunity for people to be a witness for him. He knew all along that he was coming to fulfill, fulfill the prophecy. 
He knew that the, the crowd's cheers would turn, soon turn to the cries of crucify him, crucify him. He knew what was coming. He knew that his day was getting closer where he would go to the cross and he would die for the sins of the entire world. He knew that. And he looked out and I believe he seen opportunity for people to be a witness for him. Can I tell you today what a wonderful opportunity we had last week to be a witness for our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. I'll tell you a little bit about my wife. She's in here this morning, so I can't pick on her quite as bad. A lot of times she's over in junior church. And, uh, but she, I, 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 she's my rock. I lean on her. And uh, a group of pastors was texting this week, and they said we need to provide all these lunches. And I kind of maybe got the cart before the horse a little bit before I asked the ladies here at the church. I'm like, we're, on, we're in. We're good. So my backup plan, men, was this. If the ladies told us to go fly a kite, we was going to be making some sandwiches for those fire, firefighters. But anyway, Rachel so graciously agreed. Uh, a lot of the other ladies here helped out. And I was actually at work, and uh, she texted me, and she said, I'm going to put a gospel track in these lunch bags. And I'm like, well, duh, sure, you need to do that. I hadn't even thought about it. Here I'm the pastor of the church. I'm worried about the sandwiches that need to be made. And she's thinking about getting the gospel message in those bags. What an opportunity we have to witness. Can I tell you this? I believe the Lord still looks at us today and He can weep over wasted opportunity. He looks at wasted opportunity for us to be a light and a witness for Him. If you're here today and you've accepted Christ as your Lord and Savior, you've accepted the gift of salvation that only comes through Him and His shed blood on the cross, then you are called to be a witness. You're called to be a witness. Not only that, but He looked, I believe, He's seen wasted opportunity for us to serve. Now, we're saved to serve. Let me, let me try to clear this up just a few minutes. I'll step around. I hate that some of the folks over can't see us. But s- service does not equal salvation. But salvation does equal service. You can do all the good works. We could have packed up all the lunch bags. We could have fed all the people ourselves, been glory hogs and took all the credit for it. But if we didn't have Christ in our heart, then when our day comes upon us, we're going to die and we're going to go to hell. We're not going to stand in front of God and say, well, you remember when that fire came to Page County? And man, we made 500 lunch bags. We had bologna and cheese and peanut butter and jelly. And one thing that blew Rachel's mind and and, uh, several of the people, and I'm not picking on anybody if they're watching later, they were vegans. And she's like, what in the world does a vegan eat? I said, well, I don't know. Put some... Uh, put some bananas and some nut, all those kind of things there. I don't know. I said, you know, just do what you got to do. But we could have we done all that. We could stand before the Lord and said, we packed up all these lunches. We even helped the vegans out. We put an extra gospel track in there for them. I'm sorry if anybody here is a vegan. I'm just picking. I'm totally cutting up on you. It's, it's totally a joke. But we, we, we did all we could. But he's going to look at you and say, depart from me. I never knew you because you never accepted Christ as your Lord and Savior. But those of us that are saved, that are born again, when we knew there was a need in our community, we wanted to step up and we wanted to serve. That's because that's what Christ wants us to do. And when he looks out and he sees a church filled with his people who love him, who want to uh, be a witness for him, he wants us to serve. He wants us to serve people in our community. He wants us to serve those that are not saved. I can promise you this. I don't know. I'm not the knower of all things. I'm not pretending to be God this morning. But I guarantee you all those firemen, those police, those first responders, all those people, I guarantee you not every single one of them was saved. And it was an opportunity for us to be of service for him and all along to be a witness for him. When he looks down at a church and he sees a church not serving him, I believe it's the same way when he beheld that city. He weeps. Today, I don't want to be a reason why the Lord weeps. There's been things going around on social media and said that if, if Paul was alive in this day, then the church would be getting a letter. You know, Paul wrote the letters back to the church. But anyway, let me tell you, uh, he looks and he, he weeps, but also he's seen wasted opportunity for them to rejoice. He knew they were rejoicing for the wrong reason. He knew that the crowd would quickly change their mind. And we, we preached about that uh, a few weeks ago in one of my messages from Psalm 118. It said, this is the day the Lord has made and we shall rejoice. Can I tell you, when, when they come, they should have been rejoicing, yes, that their king has come, but not the king that they thought would help them conquer the, the, the world. It was a king that would come that would bring salvation to you and I. And that's why we should rejoice. We should still rejoice today because this same Jesus that rode into town on Jerusalem on this donkey, he's still the only one that can save us. There's no other way. 
The world's going to tell you there's multiple ways. You can be a good person. You can do this. You can believe in the stars. You can speak to Mother Earth and, and all those other things we talked about this morning in Sunday school. But I can promise you this. On the authority of God's Word, the only way we can be saved is because Jesus rode into town knowing that He would go to face the death of the cross for us. We should rejoice because this is the day the Lord has made and we should be glad in it. When He gives us an opportunity to rejoice and we don't do so, I believe He weeps. All of us should be rejoicing, saying uh, thankful that the Lord sent the rain. I seen somebody on Facebook said a critic, well, if, you're, if your God is so good, why didn't He send the rain earlier? I can tell you our God is sovereign, He is just, and He knew when we needed to have that rain. Now, the fire wasn't coming down on the back of my house, but if it was, I pray that I would have the same amount of faith to stay here and say, God, you sent the rain just in the right amount of time. I'm glad every one of those men that know the Lord that was fighting those fires and those women as well would stand there and say, the Lord is just. He is sovereign. He sent the rain at just the right time. It gives us an opportunity to rejoice. We shouldn't just go on our social media platforms or wherever we're at and, and make posts just so we can get likes and, and uh, pats on the back. That's not why we should do those things. So we should point glory to God and we should be able to rejoice. I believe when we miss those opportunities to rejoice, it makes the Lord weep. He looks down and he's sad for his people that we've missed those opportunities. The second thing is this, while the crowd rejoiced, Jesus wept because not only did he uh, look back and see the city, but he looked within and he saw a few things. In verse 42 it tells us again, saying that thou hadst known even thou at the last this thy day the things which belong unto thy peace. Now they should know, the people that were there cheering should know the word of God. I believe he, he wept because he looked inside and he seen this, he seen spiritual ignorance. Can I tell you, if you're here today and you're a born-again Christian, you are to be in God's Word. You are to know God's Word. You are to study God's Word. You are not be found spiritually ignorant. Because I promise you this, there will come an opportunity for you that you might be able to witness to somebody. You, the Lord's going to give you that opportunity. You step out on faith and say, Lord, I put my faith and trust in you, and, and uh, I, I love you. I know you died on the cross for my sins. Now, I'm not trying to intimidate you at all today, but you better be ready because he's going to put somebody in, in your path that you can share his love with. You say, well, I don't know a lot of Scripture. I don't know a lot. The only way you're going to know it is if you dive into God's Word and study God's Word. He looked out and he's seen a group of people that ought to know what was going on. They ought to know that the, the prophet Zechariah had prophesied that he would come. They should know what's going on, but he looked out and he's seen a group of people that missed this opportunity because they were spiritually ignorant. They didn't realize what was going on around them. Today, I can tell you this, I would encourage you. And I, I, I love each and every one of you. These are hard words sometimes to say. But Sunday morning from 11 to 12.15 is not enough. Amen. That's not enough. I, I want to see you more. Not just so I can tell everybody, hey, we had, we had 100 people on Wednesday night Bible study. I'm not going to go out and brag about that. How many times have you ever seen me take, make a social media post said that, we had five people get saved in church, or we had this amount of people here. You're not going to find me doing that. God knows. We'll give Him glory and honor for it. The reason why is because this. I believe we need to be in God's Word. We need to be studying God's Word. And guess what? Sunday morning, Sunday night, and Wednesday night, still ain't enough either. You've got to do it at home. We've got to be in God's Word every single day. And when He looks down and He sees His people who are spiritually ignorant, I believe it's the same situation. Just as He rode into Jerusalem, He see. He weeps. He looks down and he says, wow, look at my people. They claim that they love me. They want to serve me, but yet they won't study God's word. I can tell you this, the, the biggest conviction that I have in my life is that I don't study God's word enough. That's true. I'm honest enough for you today as your pastor to tell you that the Lord lays on my heart that I ought to be studying his word more. I'm, I'm laughing to myself because I just said the good cultural word ought to. And... Uh, <laughs> One of my friends told me, he said, do you ever watch your YouTube broadcast? I said, not really. I said, I'll go back and make sure that nothing's crazy about it. He said, you ought to turn on the closed captions and see what they think you're saying sometimes. <laughs> I said, well, I, I, can think, I can think about that. So I'm not sure how uh, YouTube picked up art too, but anyway, it is. But the Lord looked down. He was upset or he came into to Jerusalem because he's seen a group of people that were spiritually ignorant. But also, he's seen a group of people, look at verse 42 again, who were blind. And can I tell you, 
The Lord looks down today on this world. He is so long-suffering. He is so patient. But He sees a group of people who are spiritually blind. Not only are we God's people spiritually ignorant, but other were spiritually blind in many ways. Look what verse 42 says at the end of it. It says, but now they are hid from my eyes. Can I tell you this? When we look out and, and we see people that we love and their, their life is a mess, we get angry, we get upset, and we want to go in with our spiritual paintbrush and paint them all up and get them looking pretty on the outside when the problem has never been addressed on the inside. We can dress them up in the best clothes. We can drag them to church with us. But if they don't have the change on the inside, they're still spiritually blind. They're blind to the sin that they're in. The Lord looked out. He's seen a bunch of people that were blind. I believe he's seen people as he rode into Jerusalem that still had a life of sin. I can promise you he looks down on our world today and he sees a world, brother, that's filled with sin. He sees a world today where we have decided that we're going to take the uh, subject of abortion. We're not even going to call it a baby. We're going to call it a fetus. And we're going to pass a law that it's legal to kill them. But we're going to call it abortion. We're going to call it a fetus. And we're going to be spiritually blind and spiritually ignorant to those things. And we're going to let it slide. I can tell you, he looks down and sees a group of people who are blind. If that don't touch your heartstrings this morning, do you realize that God created that life? just the same way as He created yours, then I believe you might be in this same condition. You might be spiritually blind yourself. He looks down. He sees those that are blind. He sees those that, that are in a life of sin. He also sees those that are going to deny Him. As I shared with you earlier, as I look out to the congregation and we see people and I, I think about wasted opportunity, I'll address the young people. Don't let any day pass you by. I know that this church and every church in Page County have got a lot of good young people. We need you. We need you to be a witness and a testimony to your generation to show others that it's not lame, that it's not boring, that, that, that no matter how old you are, you need to love the Lord and you need to serve the Lord. But he looked coming into Jerusalem and he seen a group of people who were going to deny him. He knew it. And can I tell you the saddest thing as a pastor is you get, you get up enough courage and you go somewhere and you knock on somebody's door and you want to uh, share the love of God with them and uh, I encourage you to go out visiting don't go when you go visiting don't go invite somebody to church I get aggravated when I hear that don't go invite somebody to church go and share the love of God with them he'll put them somewhere if he puts them at forward for Christ Baptist Church amen we'll take them we'll love them if he puts them down the street down the road as long as it's not this way it's that way just kidding somebody will get that inside joke <laughs> The Catholic church is down the road. I'm just kidding. But anyway, as long as he puts them in a good Bible-believing, Bible-preaching church, we'll be happy. Okay? We don't knock on the door to invite him to church. We knock on the door to share the love of God with him. But one of the most discouraging things is when we knock on the door, we get the door slammed in our face. We might get some hateful, angry words said to us. They deny, they deny the Lord. They deny the Word of God. They deny what's there. It's, it's, it's sad. Jesus looked as he rode into Jerusalem. He's seen a group of people who would deny him, and that made him upset. Can I tell you today, don't be the reason why the Lord weeps. We need to be a, 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 a church that is willing to serve the Lord. We need to be living our lives to please the Lord. All of us, the Bible says, we've sinned, we've come short of his glory. We're not going to be a perfect people, but we need to try to live a sanctified life, a set-aside life, and we need not to deny what the Lord has done for us. Number three, I'll move on here this morning. While the crowd rejoiced, Jesus wept because... He not only did he look back, he looked inside, but I believe he looked around, and this is what he saw. Look at verse number 45 through verse number 46. And when he went, this is later now, but and he went into the temple and began to cast out them that sold therein and them that bought, saying unto them, It is written, My house is the house of prayer, but you have made it a den of thieves. Now, if you want to go chronologically in, in day, we're talking about Palm Sunday. Uh, he rode into town on Sunday, but he cleared the temple out on Monday. But when he looked around those streets, he knew already what was going on inside of the temple because he wept because he saw this, a bunch of religious activity. Now, if you, if you tell somebody this morning, I came to church just to check the box. So I could tell Grandma when I called her on the phone later, I went to church. I went to church. I did what I was supposed to do. We came in, we sung a few songs, and we did all those things. We put a couple bucks in the offering plate, even though that uh, it, it hurt us tremendously to do so. And we come in and we do those things and we check the box. Well, that's religious activity. 
This, this city was booming with religious activity. Can I tell you, the Lord doesn't want to look down. He does not want to see religious activity. He wants to see God's people serving Him. He wants to see God's people loving Him. You see, religious activity is outward motions, but no inward change. I believe there's hundreds of people, maybe thousands of people right here in our community today that have gathered in church services who are not Bible-believing, Bible-preaching churches, and all they've done is check the box and went to a religious ceremony. Can I tell you, this is harsh, and some of you might disagree. They may as well just got their grocery list out and went to Walmart. If they don't sit, I'm not telling you, I'm not the best pastor in Page County, but you've got to sit underneath solid Bible, believing Bible, teaching, preaching. You've got to do so. That's why you come here and I ask you to clear your minds and your hearts so that you can be receptive to what the Word of God says. He looked around and he's seen religious activity. Can I tell you this? I don't want him to ever look down and see religious activity going on here at this church. I don't want us to get so structured and so perfect that our culture, brother, is so good that we're going we're gonna to follow this order of service, bang, 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 and you know what's going to happen, and you're going to fall asleep during the service, and we're going to leave, and we're going to check the box that we've been here. I don't want that to happen. I want us to be a group of people that the Lord looks down upon, that He smiles, that He looks down and says, there is a group of people that love me. There's a group of people that's not perfect, but there's a group of people who are trying to serve me. Don't be a group of people who get caught up in religious activity. One of the pet peeves that I have is this, and we're getting ready to expand. I've told you that. If you look out here, the, the, Alan's got the lines drawn out of the, what the new building's going to look like outside. And on the very end of it, we're going to have a, a pretty good-sized fellowship hall. Now, I'm pretty stickler about this. It's not a social hall. Amen. Now, I'm going to get quiet for just a few moments. We can go to the VFW, and we, they're gracious to us. I appreciate all that they do for us. But they got a social hall. The Moose has a social hall. The Eagles have a social hall. Other places have a social hall. They go there and they have social activities. They do their thing. I won't touch on what they do. I'm not going to do that this morning. The Lord's convicted me to move on quickly through this subject. But what I'm telling you is this. God's people have fellowship. That's why it's not going to be a social hall. It's a fellowship hall. We gather so that we can have fellowship together. What does this Holy Week mean to you? Does it mean that we just go through the motions? It's Palm Sunday, so guess what? I've got to get up and go to church. Next week's Easter Sunday. That's why we're having two services next week. Now, we might not need the, the extra seats, Floyd, after I say this. You can't just come to church on Easter Sunday and get everything that you need and check the box. Do I say you're not saved, not going to heaven? I'm not saying that. But I'm telling you, in order for us to please the Lord, we need to do more for Him. Yes. And it's not just religious activity. It's not just social activities. It's fellowship with Him. Lastly, I'll come down to a close with this. Uh, while the crowds rejoiced, Jesus wept because he looked ahead. Now, let me tell you, he had looked around, he had looked back, he had looked inside, but he also looked ahead, and what he saw made him weep. Can I tell you this? When he looks ahead and he sees a person's life and they're heading down a, a path of destruction, he, I believe he weeps. I believe he weeps for that person. He's upset. He loves them. So, he's so long-suffering, he's got to be upset because... He sees what's coming. He's seen what was coming for the, the city that he was riding into. Look at verse 43 through verse 44. He explains it in, in great detail. He says, For the day shall come upon thee that thy enemy shall cast a trench about thee and compass thee round and keep thee in on every side and shall lay thee even with the ground and thy children within thee and they shall not leave in thee one stone upon another because thou knewest not the time of my salvation. He knew that destruction was coming for Jerusalem. If you study history, if you study the Word of God, you know that the Romans would come in, that they would kill over 600,000 Jews. They would come in, and judgment was coming. Can I tell you, when he looks down at us, he sees a group of people, and I can promise you, judgment's coming. The Bible says it's appointed once a man to die, and after that, the judgment. All of us will stand before a righteous and a holy God. Now, if we're saved and born again, we won't give account for our sins, but we're going to give an account for that service that I talked about earlier. What have you done for me? But if you're not saved, you're going to stand before this holy God, and you're going to have to give an account for all those things that you're done. And I can tell you, it's a situation that you don't want to be in. The Lord looked, and He's seen judgment was coming on to Jerusalem. He knew, and He wept. Not only was judgment coming, but He knew captivity was coming. 
Not only did they kill over 600,000 Jews, but they would take men and women, boys and girls, hostage to be slaves. We see it today. You say, well, I don't know about that. I can tell you, if you're not born again, we see people who are living a life of sin, they are held captive by that sin. They're blind. They don't realize it, but they're being held captive. Jesus wept because he knew that captivity was coming. Not only was captivity coming, but destruction was coming. He seen that he said there not any stone would be unturned. Uh, he said that, that they're going to cast a trench around you. He says that they're going to come at you from every side. He knew that destruction was coming. I can tell you, if we see somebody we love, we ought to be on our knees praying for them. We ought to be sharing the love of God with them because judgment's coming to them. They've been held captive by sin, and we can see destruction going on in their life. The Lord looked, and he seen, he looked ahead. He seen judgment, he seen captivity, and he seen destruction. So I'll come to a close this morning. I'll ask you this question. When the Lord looks at us, what does he see? Does he see any of those things that I've described that made him weep? If he does, then I believe we need to get that fixed. The Lord's made a way. He's told us. He didn't tell us that we had to be a perfect person. Matter of fact, he told us that we would never be perfect. He says that our righteousness is of filthy rags. But he told us we need to put our faith and trust in him. He says that we receive salvation. Faith cometh by hearing and hearing from the word of God. We accept Christ into our heart. And we ask him to come in. Lord, guide me. Lord, show me. Here, this is a Sunday. Palm Sunday. The Lord has rode into town. On Monday, he, he looked around. He's seen all this religious activity. He, he goes in. He clears out the temple. If you go through and you keep studying, uh, they go through preparing for the Passover. Our Lord would, would set on trial. And then on Friday, he would go to the cross. And he would bear the sins of the entire world. He would bear your sins. He would bear my sins. Saturday, they'd get him down off that cross. They would bury him. But on Sunday morning, we know that he defeated death, hell, and the grave, and he rose again. Wouldn't it be a sad thing if we come here today? And wouldn't it be just a religious ceremony if we come in and said, well, we had this great God. He came and he did many great things. And, and uh, they, they crucified him. They hung him on a cross and they buried him. And, and there we take our, our gifts to his grave. You see, any other religion in the world, that's all they got. They've got a God who is dead and who is buried. You and I have a God who is alive, who loves us, who wants us to serve Him, who wants us to accept Him as our Lord and Savior. So this morning, as Ruth comes to the piano, I want you to bow your heads, and I want you to look at this scene as I've described it through the eyes of the Lord, but I want you to look at it as your life. If the Lord looked at your life this morning, would He be able to rejoice or would He weep? As she begins to play this morning, every head bowed and every eye closed. If you're here and you say, Pastor, I don't have a relationship with Christ. Well, I can tell you this. I believe you've heard the gospel message this morning. Sure, I could have probably done it better. I could have said things differently. But the word of God, I pray, has spoken to your heart. If you're here, I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand. I'm not going to ask you to do all those things this morning. But if the Lord has spoke to your heart and you say, you know what? I'm not sure that I'm saved. I'm not sure that I've accepted this free gift of salvation. If the Lord spoke to your heart, I would encourage you to respond. I'll be waiting for you here at the altar. I've got my Bible. If you're a lady, I'll get a lady to, to deal with you, to talk with you, to pray with you. Show you how easy it is to give your life to Christ. To know for sure that you're saved. If you're here and you're born again, you say, you know, there's some areas in my life that maybe if the Lord looked at today, he'd probably weep. He'd probably be a little upset. I would encourage you to come up here, pray, turn it over to the Lord, and ask him to help you in those things in your life. Ruth's going to continue to play every head bowed, every eye closed. If you're listening today, by the way, of our uh, YouTube broadcast, I would encourage you the same. Don't put it off any, other, any longer. Ask Christ to come into your heart to be your Lord and your Savior. It'll be the best decision you've ever made. I'm not going to drag the service out. 